G'day guys, this is why I bought my sliding panel saw. So first up, it's a 2500 millimeter stroke, so that means it can move forward 25 meters, uh, 2500 millimeters that way. And 2500 millimeters back the other way. That means I can get a full eight foot sheet on this slider and rip the entire length, which is just beautiful when I'm working with uh, MDF sheets or even dining table, solid timber dining table tops. Comes in really handy. It's a Prima 2500 which I purchased from Leadercraft in Victoria, Australia. Now it's a Chinese import machine which the model number is MJ6125TZ. So it's a TZ, a TZ series panel saw. It's equipped with a 12 inch diameter saw blade as well as a riving knife. And you'll notice that that riving knife is close enough to the saw blade that my fingers don't actually fit between it. Now that's an appropriately set riving knife. The top edge is slightly under the top surface of the saw blade here so that I can still make my grooving cuts over the top of it. But that riving knife isn't so far back that I can get my fingers in there. So to set these riving knives, it's as close as practicable without actually touching the blade. Now, the general rule is if you can't get your finger in there between it, it's good enough. So we're about a quarter inch away from the saw blade there, perfect. I could get it closer, but it's not really beneficial to me. The maximum cutting height is approximately 83 millimeters high, or, or three inches and three eighths. That's a bit of a let down, because working with solid timber, I often cut four inch thick table legs. And so in order to do it with this blade, or with this machine, I need to roll it around and cutting multiple passes just to get the full maximum cutting height. It's a small problem, but a problem nonetheless. One thing that I really like about sliding panel saws in general is that they generally always have overhead guards that are not, a, not attached to the riving knife. Now in this one in particular, it goes up and down so I can set it to the height of my material so it's, it captures a lot of the dust because you get a lot of dust that comes up the back of the saw blade and comes spewing out, whereas here it comes up and there's a dust port that goes through the dust extraction there and off it goes. That's really good. It also serves as a protection, even though obviously you can see that it's pretty flimsy because it's on a, about a 1.4 meter arm and so it's pretty flimsy. So if I knock it really hard, it can actually hit into the side of the blade, which you can, if you look closely, you can see there are some score marks in this uh, overhead guard, but I prefer it to eat a bit of plastic than to eat a little bit of flesh. And because it's there, it serves as a physical boundary for me not to go too close to it. I can also roll the blade over to 45 degrees. Hey, that went bang. Oh, no. Forgot to close the blade cover inside. <laughs> Still good, no harm done. Now it takes a while to get over to 45 degrees. That's because the screw thread that's activating the blade winding it's a pretty fine thread, so it gives me good control over the angles, but it just takes a long time to get over there. And we're at 45 degrees because I can see on my digital readout that it says 45 degrees and I know that it's pretty accurate. Now, now that I'm at 45 degrees though, this guard does nothing for me. It's the blades over here somewhere, 
but the guard's not doing anything. So what I can do there, I undo this knob, take the guard out, and put this big one on there. Which now fully envelops the blade on that side there. And that now prevents my hand from going too close to the blade that's now leaning over. So that's really good too. Now, in a perfect world, I would leave this big guard on all the time. The problem with that is that it now limits my ripping width to about 100 mil, unless I lift all the way up. In which case, yes, now I can get my fence in over there, but I, I don't have any access. So even if I try to get my push stick in there, I can't do it. It just it get, gets in the way. So it's a bit of a pain in the butt. One of the things that I really prefer about these sliding panel saws rather than a table saw is the fence mechanism. Now, whoops, it's a bit squeaky, but you can see that this is a very substantial casting. It's not flimsy, it's not, it's not crappy, it's really good. And there's a bit of a, I can adjust where this fence goes. So for example, when I'm ripping timber, let's say I'm ripping 100 mil wide timbers. Now, on your standard ta table saw fence, you've got no option. The fence just is always all the way past the blade. There. Now that's actually a really bad way to rip timber. Now I often do it because I don't really care. But the, the correct way of doing it is that you have your blade set just past the halfway point of your, or you have your fence set just past the halfway point of your blade. That way when you're pushing through with your push stick, you push here and now it's, it's clear, it's now clear of the blade. You don't have to keep on going pushing back here somewhere. Because now that I'm back here somewhere, my hand is right next to the saw blade. It's a really bad situation. Whereas here you come through and I'm done. My hand isn't even up to the saw blade yet. So even if I was dumb enough, to put my hand right over the top of the saw blade or right in front of the saw blade path, I'm still not going to cut myself because, well, I'm, I've already finished pushing. I don't have to push any further unless I'm dumb enough just to keep pushing just like an idiot, but I like to think that I'm smarter than that. He's hoping. The other thing is I've got a low fence or a high fence. So I can set it like that. As a general rule, I'll use my low fence. I only use the high fence when I need good vertical support. If I was holding something up really high, which is a really dodgy move that I shouldn't do, but I do without hesitation because, well, I'm just not that smart as we almost discussed just a second ago. Another good thing about this fence system is that if I was looking to cross cut some boards and using this fence as my stop, if I was to do this with that fence all the way out there, it will bind, this board will bind between the fence and the blade and it will throw it back at me at a million miles an hour. So what I can do, I can simply pull the fence all the way back and by the time it finishes cutting, this board has cleared this fence and we're out of harm's way. So this here, the outrigger, the slider outrigger, this is the true value of a sliding panel saw, obviously. And what it does, what I've got here, I've got a bar that it just, locks onto the slider and I can set it wherever I want it to be. So where I want it to be is I want it right behind me upper thigh, my upper gluteus. And so now when I do this, I, I have full control over the slider. So now I have very powerful control over the slider without having to use my upper body. Like if I was using a crosscut sled on a table saw, I would be first I'm out here somewhere because the back of the table saw is here, but the saw blade's out here, so I'm forever having to push forward out here somewhere. And because I've got a fence on my crosscut sled, I can't actually see the tips of my fingers. Whereas here, I'm looking straight down on top of my workpiece, and I'm just pushing through with my legs. So I could do this all day. That's getting a little bit creepy. So if I want to cut here, I can, I can just push it through, done, push it through, done, etc, etc. That's a really beneficial uh, thing about the slider over a, a crosscut sled on a table saw. This, that in itself would be 
the biggest reason as to why I bought this sliding panel saw over a table saw, even though this thing cost me more than a table saw. But you've got to remember that, okay, I've got my sliding panel saw here. Now I can cross cut about 1200 mil on that side of the blade and however, however much space I've got from the blade to that wall over there, which is about four meters. So I could cross cut four meters. Let's say if I wanted to cut a meter off a five meter board, I could do that with four meters that way and a meter that way. No drums at all. Or if I'm just trying to cut something that's 2,500 mil long, if I do this, if I use that one there, it sends that outrigger out there and I can cut, what, what does it go up to? It goes up to uh, 3,400. Now, I don't really use this as a general rule because it, once it goes all the way out there, there's so much weight on it that it ends up dropping down and it just gets in the way. I don't really do it. All I do is I just put a tape measure on there, mark my line, and then I just move it up to my line and cut. But it's there, it's an option. And one thing that I see both amateurs and professionals doing wrong is that when they're cross cutting, they'll have their fence set up to the front of the outrigger here, which I could do. As a general rule, I keep it at the back of the outrigger so that when I'm cross cutting, I can stand here and have just one finger there. And because the fulcrum is all the way over here, in order for that the force of the cutting action to pull this timber forward, it needs to overcome I don't know, a meter worth of leverage. Whereas the amateurs and a lot of professionals, what they do is they leave their, their fence up the front and then they try to hold it up against the fence like this. And what they have to do, they need to hold, hold back that fence really hard and really put their arm in there as hard as they possibly can. So that, because the fulcrum is all the way over here, so you've got a massive mechanical disadvantage over that saw blade and it just pulls it away from the saw blade. And once that happens, you ruin your cut, you ruin your workplace and you, you send timber flying at your head. So other things to consider about the slider is that you need the physical space to put it in. Now, that's not a real big problem for me. Like my garage isn't huge. It's it's bigger than standard, but it's not it's not massive. Like this takes up a huge part of my garage. But the way that I see it is is that all right. So the the stationary footprint of this machine is is massive. It's like 3.6 wide by I don't know, two and a half meters wide. But the working area is 3.6 wide and five meters, so it's a huge space. If I had a table saw though, it's not as wide, but it's still as long, because I'm still gonna wanna be able to rip 2,500 at least. So I'm gonna need 2,500 behind me and 2,500 in front of me. So it still takes up quite a bit of room. You could say, oh, but you could put an outfeed table in there, and you could put a router table in there and whatnot. Yeah, you can, like a table saw will take up less room, but it's not, it's not as cut and dry as all of that. Furthermore, with this, because I was saying I can dock timbers pretty easily with this thing, I don't need a chop saw or a miter saw. So if I did have a miter saw, I'd want to be able to dock, let's say, three meter lengths at least. Really, I want to be able to dock about five meter lengths. So the only, where, the only place I could do that is along this back wall there. Instead, I've got a bench there, a bench over there, my router table there, my drill press is usually over there somewhere, but it's not there at the moment. So I don't need that. And what else? So I'd have to buy a table saw, let's say $3,000. I'd have to buy a mitre saw, as well as building a mitre saw stand, which could be fancy, could be simple, but let's say another $1,000 for the saw, plus another $1,000 for the cabinetry, because it's gonna take me X amount of time to build it. So there's um, $5,000 so far. And I still can't rip boards easily or very straight. I can't straight line rip boards. But here I can straight line rip. Oh, I'm stuck. Here I can straight line rip 2,500, a full, a full length of sheet, which is a common task with what we do. So now I don't need a track saw. So there's another $1,000. So this machine cost me well, it was about six and a half thousand dollars about four years ago. Well, I think now they're about seven thousand dollars or thereabouts. Or I could have spent what six thousand dollars on a miter saw, a table saw, and a track saw 
and then messed around making cross-cut sleds and having to replace those cross-cut sleds when they wear out because you picked them up and you dropped them and they all exploded and whatnot. So it's just one of those things. Another question I get commonly asked is, this thing's right up my butt, is what do I think about the saw stop? Yeah, the saw stop's bloody brilliant. Um, I, I feel that if you ever bought the saw stop because you thought you were going to need the um, technology behind it because you thought that there was a good chance you're going to touch that blade while it's spinning and you're going to need that to save your fingers. My advice would be don't buy a saw stop, don't buy a panel saw, don't buy a table saw, don't do woodwork. There's that. However, accidents do happen and if I had the choice of having the saw stop technology on this thing, yeah I'd take it. but. I take it simply because it's a good thing to have. I'm not taking it because it's like it's not like a seatbelt in a car. Seatbelt in the car, well, I'm a good driver, I'm not gonna crash. But the other idiot on the other side of the road, he's gonna crash into me, therefore I need my seatbelts. Whereas here, I'm in control of what I'm doing. So I'm a good driver, I'm not gonna crash this thing, I'm not gonna crash my hands into the saw blade. So technically I shouldn't need the technology, but if it was available and I could get it, and I could afford it, yeah, I'd like it. So, and the saw stop, beautiful table saw, but I'd take this thing over a saw stop any day of the week. So, and I hope that helps for everybody that's been asking me questions about my panel saw, how much it costs, where do I get it from, why do I get it, do I love it, do I like it, do I hate it? Yeah, it's pretty good, it's, it's, it works pretty well for me, so. Hmm. Enough rambling and I'll catch us next time.